All right, so in terms of what we have left to talk about related to accounting, there's really kind of just one closing thought that I, I have added here towards the end, and that is we primarily have been talking about financial accounting, but let, let's come back to it and at least just talk about cost accounting for a moment. And, and as we've already observed, cost accounting primarily focuses on managing and allocating costs. So it's about an organization getting a, a true picture of, of their costs. And, and you might think that that's not, um, maybe not that hard for them to do, but in fact, it's very, very challenging. And it, it incorporates a lot of things that can give companies significant headaches. For example, um, we recently have gone through a period in this country where oil prices have fluctuated quite wildly. Well, if we're a company that uses a lot of uh, oil or oil derivative products in making our products, or even in logistics moving things around, um, that kind of variation in market prices could have a dramatic impact on what we need to charge our customers in order to break even. Well, what happens if we need to charge higher prices, but the market is unwilling to pay those higher prices? But we really face some very challenging decisions as an organization, and so we want to make sure that as best we can, we not only understand our current cost position, but we have a forward look to that as well, where we might employ some people that would assist with this that might be more um, economically focused and more uh, market scanning focused and help us analyze various trends because this is an area that can really be a key strategic driver of uh, competitiveness for our company or could be an area where we could be outcompeted by those other companies in our industry. Now, in terms of the information handling portion of cost accounting, really all of the details of our financial transactions in our company is, is captured in financial accounting. So all cost accounting has to do in order to get the data it needs is be able to leverage the information that is already in the system for the sake of financial accounting. And, and the mechanism for that is, is pretty straightforward. Um, companies engage in various business processes, and as those processes occur, costs are incurred. And we have already observed that those costs would be captured in various financial accounting documents, or FI documents, that are kicked out periodically by steps in our business processes. So we have the ability to capture that information as processes go along. But there are times when we might need kind of a little bit more detail. For example, instead of just capturing the financial accounting implications of something that happened in a given step, we might want to accrue all of the costs associated with the execution of an entire process and then at the end of that process, settle those records to something that would enable us to do some cost accounting reporting and, and calculations. Apart from that, companies need a way of figuring out how they're going to consider and think about cost within their organization. And so a very commonly employed mechanism in most organizations is the concept of a cost center. And a cost center is a cost accounting uh, entity. So it's an, it's an organizational entity in terms of organizational data. And it allows us to track and capture costs based on where in an organization those costs were incurred. So to give you an example of that here in a university setting, each department in a university would be classified as a cost center. And so the people that work in that department would have their salaries charged against that cost center, resources that are consumed, all of those things would be kind of captured in terms of a given set of cost centers and then reported up throughout the organizational hierarchy 
to allow us to better understand costs associated with different facets of the organization. A, a good metaphor to think of when you think of a cost center is to kind of imagine a, a giant sponge. And the way this is typically treated in an organization is if we are going to engage in cost accounting, then every expense that we have as an organization is going to be assigned to a cost center. So a great example of that, and we'll just keep this very general at this point and talk about it in more detail later in the semester. We are currently sitting in Nick's Hall. Nick's Hall as a building contains, let's see, I, I think we contained four different cost centers. We have uh, ITS, which is primarily on the fourth floor of this building. We have the Department of Computing, which is primarily on the fourth floor of this building. We have the College of Nursing, which is primarily on the third and uh, the second and third floors. We have the, I think it's the Department of Appalachian Studies, which has part of the first floor. Oh, and then there's another one. We have the, what's it called, the Health Center that's part of the first floor. So there are five cost centers in this particular building. Well, we talked last time about depreciation. Well, I have no idea what it costs to build this building. And given its age, the building itself is probably paid for. But I do know not that long ago, this building was renovated. This used to be the library. And it was turned into the building as it sits now when the other library was built. So let's just say hypothetically that the university spent $25 million renovating this building. And now this particular asset is, is potentially going to be depreciated, if you will. And so we determine as a, as a university, you know, we're going to charge the, the cost of this building is about $1.5 million a year. And then we also have costs associated with building upkeep that we'll just say is about half a million dollars a year. And then we have things like electricity and water and other things that are consumed in this building. So when we put a calculator to it, let's say the cost of this building to the university every year is $3 million. Well, every cost has to be assigned to a cost center. So the university would say, okay, nursing is here, uh, computing is here, Appalachian Studies is here, um, the health clinic is here, and ITS is here. And, and just to make it nice and simple, we're just going to divide this equally among them. So the nurses get charged 600000 as do we, as do all of the other entities here. And we have now allocated the costs to various cost centers that occupy the building. That's the concept here of all of our costs as an organization are captured in terms of a cost center. So when the Department of Computing goes out and buys paper to put in printers, that's going to be reflected in our cost center. And so on an annual or quarterly or whatever reporting period we want to use basis, the university can say, okay, how much is it costing us for the computing department to exist? And of course, you can imagine that then that could be paired with things like, okay, well, how much is the computing department bringing in? And they look at tuition and other things that are generated by the department. And you can do a very quick calculation to see is a given department kind of bringing in more than they're costing the university. The construction of these cost centers, deciding what's a cost center and what things are grouped together to be a singular cost center, and deciding how to disperse costs among the cost center is a huge matter of contention in most organizations. Because costs tend to be like a real world giant game of hot potato. Nobody wants them, okay? So typically there has to be organizational rules or some entity that says, you might not like it, but this is the way this is going to be reported. And so cost centers allow us a way of measuring and monitoring things in that fashion. 
these, this cost accounting reporting is considered to be master data focused on controlling. So this is kind of interesting. A moment ago, I made the observation that cost centers are, are really an example of organizational data. I don't think that's an incorrect statement, but you could also see where um, there are entities within these cost centers that would be master data that would be focused on, on controlling. And the point that I made a moment ago is really the key here. If we are going to do cost accounting, then every expense, every cost that we incur as an organization is going to have to be assigned to a cost center. So we have to decide exactly how it is we are going to do that. You can imagine, for an example, an organization that makes many different kinds of products. And so some costs would be assigned to one product line where other costs would be assigned to other product lines. And we have to figure out how to allocate those in a way that, that would be fair. I mentioned a moment ago the idea of as a process goes on, we capture all of the cost data associated with that process. Well, what I was describing there is the concept of a cost object. Now, don't get cost centers and cost objects confused with one another. A cost center is typically associated with an organizational entity, much like we were describing a moment ago in terms of the various university departments. A cost object is simply a document that captures costs until such a time as they are settled to various cost centers. So imagine a business process that goes on, such as um, the production process. And let's assume that in our given example here, the production process involves a, an extended period of work going on in many different work centers over a, an extended period of time. And so what happens is when the process begins, we begin accumulating costs. Okay, these were the raw materials that were allocated to the project, and these were some of the other things that were allocated. And then over time, various people work on the process, and so their time is recorded. And maybe there's other things that incur costs as the process continues. So as the process goes from step to step to step to step, we have a cost object, which is a document, that just accrues all of the costs, accumulates all the costs. And in the production process that I've been using as an example here, that's the role of a production order. Remember, the production order is what authorizes the factory to begin work. Well, there's a very nice metaphor. If you could imagine that every job had a physical piece of paper associated with it, and anytime someone worked on that job, they wrote down their name and their time. And then at the end of the job, someone would sit down with a calculator and tabulate all of that to figure out how much manpower was expended. That's exactly what the production order does. But it does so in an automated fashion as people record their work on jobs, as equipment scans various things in and out of uh, different work centers. All of those costs can be accumulated. And then at the very end, we could say, OK, the cost of this particular production run was this much money, and these are the results of the production run, and therefore we can do things like actually calculate a unit cost or other things of that sort. And so what happens here is, is these costs are captured in terms of these cost objects. The cost objects then get allocated to cost centers, and in keeping with my metaphor from a moment ago of hot potato, the cost centers have the ability to reallocate their cost to other cost centers. So wh what do I mean by that? Well, here's a good example. Um, the health center. Well, no, let's not use the health center as an example. Let's use ITS as an example. We observed a moment ago that ITS was going to hypothetically be charged $600,000 for the use of this building. Well, here's the thing about ITS. They are a true cost center in that they generate a lot of expenses, but they don't make any money. They don't generate any revenue at all. So what ITS will do is they will in turn say, we provide services 
to all the different departments in this organization. So therefore, based on that, every one of the departments is going to be charged $50,000 a year for our services. And so they take the costs that have been handed to them and they cut them up into pieces and they allocate them out to other places in the organization under the theory that you know, the computing department uses computers and employs uh, the services of the help desk and network technicians and so on. And so they should pay a share of the costs associated with it. So that's why we create, and what you've done in your labs, is you create these cost center hierarchies, which give us a way of taking costs and over time kind of allocating them throughout our organization to get a true picture of what it actually costs for us to engage in certain activities. That is about a 10 minute overview of a concept that people that are cost accountants will take multiple university classes on and talk about in great detail because this can be a very interesting job that people have in organizations to work in cost accounting and it is very 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 non-trivial any questions about this okay the last thing to mention here is just a, a comment about reporting in the context of financial accounting. Pretty much what you are looking at is, is two kinds of reporting. We have the day-to-day -day information display to people in our organization based on information revolving around the general ledger. How much are our current accounts payable? What's the status of our account with a particular vendor? All of that is going to be captured in our general ledger or various subsidiary ledgers. And of course, we have transactions, as we'll look at in a moment, that allow us to actually look at that information. The other thing, of course, is financial statements. Financial statements here, we're talking about balance sheet, income statements, statement of cash flows, and, and so on. That is something that you have to configure in your organization. And what's kind of interesting is the current lab sequence that I have you going through, you do not actually create a financial statement. It is something that really actually takes a few hours of work to do, with the merit being that once you're done, you only have to create it one time. But what you do when you set up these financial statements is you think in terms of, okay, a balance sheet. The balance sheet captures assets, liabilities, and equity. So which accounts go where on the balance sheet? And how do I want things perhaps summarized? Maybe I want these five accounts added together and showing up as one line item that the user can then drill down into for more information. You have a lot of wizards and report builders to help you create this, but it does take a pretty long period of time for you to actually create that. So we don't do that, but you've all seen these before. Um, if you can remember back to your um, experience with ERP SIM, where you could run transaction F.01 and actually look at the income statement and, and balance sheet. Now, as far as the account information here, you can go in and you can look at the balance of any particular account and then if it has been enabled in the account and this is an optional thing you can go through and drill down and from the summarized balance you can continue to drill down until you actually see the original fi document but as i've noted here this is something that a company specifically has to say that they want to be able to do if you don't want to support that functionality, then users can look at account balances, but not actually drill down. Now, I don't really know why you would go to the effort of having a system like this and not supporting drill down, um, but maybe for security or other purposes, you just don't want your people accessing records in that fashion. Uh, let me show you an example of, of what I'm talking about here. Um, let's go back into our ERP system here. 
So give me a moment to get that started and get us logged in. Oh, apparently I am logged on in my office as well. Oh, and apparently I just chose the wrong of the two options. Okay. This is the one I wanted. Okay, and I'm not going to navigate through the uh, menu here. I'm just going to type in the transaction code. And so I want to look at the balance of a, a particular account. And um, I can look this up, of course. And so I'm going to look at my uh, cash account. So I'll drill down here and, and tell it which general ledger I want to work with here. And uh, the account I want is my bank account. And I have to specify my company code because, of course, we could have multiple um, organizations using the same chart of accounts. And then this is the year 2016. So, so when I execute that, this shows me my balance of the account. Now, notice a few things here. We see um, debits and credits broken out separately and then the balance here. So if you think about it, bank account is an asset account. So debits are what we would generally consider good. That's the equivalent of our cash growing. So this says in the month of August, we had debits of 209,000, credits of 24,000, which is the equivalent of our having uh, an increase in our cash of 185,000. And then we go into September, and you can see we haven't done a lot of transactions here against this account in September. We've just debited the account for a whopping $2 here, and so we see our current balance. So we have columns here for every month. What's month 13? What's that? It's a closing period or a reconciliation period. And it just so happens that when we configured our organization, we said we wanted 12 reporting periods, 12 months, plus one closing period. There's nothing that says we have to do it that way. We could want, we could elect to do quarterly closing, in which case we would have 12 months and four quarters. So we would actually have 13, 14, 15, and 16 sitting here. And they would just show up in this manner that you see it here, and those closing periods would, would be essentially thought of as months. Now, in keeping with what I, I mentioned just a moment ago, okay, I want details here. I want details about these $24,295 worth of, of credits. Yes? Yeah, I think normally the way you do it is you try and keep 1 through 12 corresponding to the actual calendar months, and then the closing months get tacked on to the end. I know here at, at ETSU, um, the final annual closing happens in, in month 17. So I think they're doing 1 through 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 for quarterly, and then 17 for year end but you have flexibility there in your organization. So if I want more information on these credits, I just double click on that. And here are all of the financial accounting documents that resulted in the balance that we see here. And I could say, oh, well, this guy right here, remember we have things like here's document types. So potentially if we worked with this every day, we would probably know what those document types were right off. I'm guessing that SA has to do with sales. I don't recall off the top of my head what KZ stands for. And if I wanted more information, I could highlight a line and click on the little glasses here. And this would take me to the actual document here where we see the $750 here. 
uh, and we could, of course, look at other elements of this. But most notably, we could click on the little hat here and see, actually, it's not the hat that I want. It's the mountains that I want that show me that actually this is a transaction from Spy Gear, where Spy Gear paid me $745 um, against their account, and, and we put it in our, our bank account here. So I can drill down and go back as far as I would like here. There's no further drill down here possible. We're kind of at the end of the line. But I can start with any given item in my summary here and drill back to the source document that rolls up to that. So this is an example of the kind of day-to-day -day reporting that's available to me um, within my financial accounting reporting. Financial statements, we can generate lots of different financial statements, which means that we could generate a version of our balance sheet for the sake of publishing it in our annual report. And because we're doing it that way, we have certain requirements that come to us by way of law, but we probably want to disclose as little as we possibly can about the inner workings of our organization. So we are going to highly summarize things where we can do so. But a balance sheet that's created for internal use might break things out to a much finer grain of detail. Well, financial statement versions enable me to do that. I could say, show me a balance sheet for my annual report. Show me a balance sheet for distribution to my board of directors. Show me a balance sheet for distribution to my plant managers. And that's where we can get into, we can create these with as much or as little detail as we want, and the system supports us generating multiple variations. Same source data, but just going to be different in how things are summarized and presented. Generally speaking, the documents that we're talking about here are the balance sheet, the income or profit and loss statement, and the statement of cash flows. And as I have indicated, um, usually the format for these documents and what level of summarizing I'm going to be able to do and not do is captured in things like generally accepted accounting principles, IRS guidelines, SEC, and so on. You know, we're not going to be able to say assets and report one lump sum amount and have that be it. You know, we can't have a three-line balance sheet that would be assets, liabilities, equity, end of statement. You know, we are going to be required to break that out in a little bit more detail, and the ins and outs of that are nothing we certainly want to take on in this class, and I'm sure they change to one degree or another on a semi-regular basis. So that's the merit of something like this. If a law or requirement changes and we have to go in and adjust our method of presentation, it doesn't at all change the data capture. We can go back in well after the data is captured and just explain how we want the output to be crafted by the system. This is important because we do have laws now like Sarbanes-Oxley that's going to require our CEO and our CFO to certify the accuracy of these reports. I'm operating under the presumption that neither of them want to go to jail, so they will want these reports to be accurate and in every way compliant with the law. And so one of the reasons why companies are willing to invest money in systems of this sort is to make sure that they are in compliance. It's basically throwing money at a given problem in order to make sure we have a good solution. Yes, sir? Nonprofits, now it, it may not be universal among all nonprofits, but I know nonprofits, once they get to a certain size, still file uh, with the IRS. They just don't have to pay any money, but they do have to do IRS filings every year because the government wants to keep track of money 
uh, especially now in this era where money is so tightly tracked as a way of of uh, doing things like trying to prevent terrorist activities and so on. So yeah, even organizations that don't have to pay taxes, um, I, I don't know that a, a nonprofit would have to report to the SEC, but I do know that they have to report to the IRS. Other questions? All right, so this slide that is at the end of your deck illustrates exactly what we just looked at, where we start with uh, being able to look at an account balance, and then we can drill down and look at actual line items, and from there we can actually see the originating FI document that actually shows us the general ledger entities. So this kind of traceability is very important in an organization, and I can tell you one group that as a whole really likes this is this makes auditing activities much, much, much easier for us to be able to isolate perhaps an area that we want to dig into in more detail and be able to step through and see all of the transaction history here makes the role of an auditor much easier. One thing that, that I can't show you in the system because we haven't created anything that would leverage this in our lab work is we talked about assets and asset management and depreciation and so on. There's actually a specialized transaction in the system called the Asset Explorer, where if you set up an asset as an asset in the system, you can launch the Asset Explorer and it will show you the history of that asset. It will show you when you bought it, how much you paid, perhaps any additional investments and upkeep of that asset that would be capitalized, and then it will show you all of the past depreciation postings and will show you future planned depreciation postings. And it gives you the ability as well to do kind of a what-if analysis to see which depreciation schedule you might want to employ for a given asset class. And so the Asset Explorer uh, is a tool in the system that allows the people that are making these kinds of decisions to, to um, look at this. Keep in mind that the way this will typically be handled in an organization is we have a lot of things we put into the system when the asset is acquired, but then the depreciation run is like just a batch transaction that gets run once a year and typically in a closing period, in our example here, period 13, that would go through and apply all of the depreciation expenses as, as are warranted based on the decisions that we have made in regards to our different assets. And so I believe, yes, that is the end of our discussion in financial accounting. Any questions about anything that we have talked about today or prior to this before we hasten on to our next topic? Yes, sir. Let me go here and then I'll go here. So, yes, sir. Uh, previously, you had said that cost accounting was optional in organizations. So, if you decide not to do that, you wouldn't have any cost centers or cost offsetting. That's right. That's to all that is totally optional. Now, I don't know why you would spend money on a tool like SAP ERP and not do cost accounting, but you don't have to. It's, it's not legally required, so it's not a required facet of the system. Yes, sir? Sarbanes-Oxley, and I, I don't know that I can give you a very thorough description of it, but Sarbanes-Oxley came out of the era when there were a lot of companies that were engaged in financial accounting and governmental reporting that was fundamentally fraudulent. Uh, one organization that kind of was the poster child for this was Enron. Enron looked very profitable on paper. They attracted a lot of investors, but fundamentally they actually had no value. It was all uh, a bunch of lies, essentially. And when that became public knowledge, an awful lot of people lost an awful lot of money, but the people who perpetrated the crime wound up with a lot of money and very little legal liability. And so laws were passed that said, you know, if something like this happens, 
the people that are involved in it should face jail time as a penalty. And so Sarbanes-Oxley requires companies when they file statements with the government to have various people that are signing those documents that if those documents turn out to be fraudulent, those people could potentially go to jail. And so it kind of ups the ante in actually associating not just civil penalties like fines, but actual jail time with fraudulent activities. And so Sarbanes-Oxley is really a, a set of various laws aimed at trying to curb business fraud and applying steep penalties to uh, the people who perpetrate them. So you hear a lot in the news these days about you know, companies potentially being called before Congress or drawn into court and, and people potentially going to jail. Really before Sarbanes-Oxley, jail was never on the table. You could be charged with fraudulent accounts, your money could be taken from you, but I think the mindset was some people were willing to roll the dice and say, hey, if I get caught, the worst thing I have to do is just give back my money. Well, now they're looking at more than that. So that's the idea there. Other questions? <laughs>